Hey everybody, I'm Amanda with DevExpress and welcome to our Take a Tour 12.2 series of webinars. Today, Chief Scientist of the IDE team, Mark Miller, and Code Rush Community Evangelist, Rory Becker, will walk you through what's new in Code Rush for 12.2. In this session, you'll see the new debugger visualizer, the decompiler, the Code Rush training windows and feature advisor, and much, much more. There will also be time for a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So please enter your questions at any time in the questions section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Now before we get started, the team here at DevExpress would love to know a little bit more about all of you joining us today. So we do have a couple of poll questions for you. And here is the first one. What is your current knowledge of Code Rush? And you can select one of the following answers. You're currently using Code Rush. You've researched Code Rush but haven't used it yet or you're hoping to find out what Code Rush does today. So I'll give everyone just a second to get that answer in. It looks like about 69% of you currently use Code Rush, and about 14% even have researched but don't use it and or are hoping to find out what it does today. Cool. And then our second question is, what level of product, DevExpress product, do you currently have? You can again select one of the following universal subscription, the Experience Enterprise subscription, you're a platform subscriber, meaning ASP.NET, WinForms, Silverlight, etc., or you are not yet a DevExpress customer. So again, I'll give everyone just a second to get these answers in. Awesome. So about 36% of you are universal, about 15% of you are not yet a DevExpress customer. No, man, I'm just realizing on that, uh, on that uh, poll, we don't have an option to simply say I simply own CodeRush, so there may be percentage of folks who are just code rush owners that don't own any of the platform. Yeah, if you're just a code rush owner, you can pop that into that questions box and let us know that as well. Thanks, Mark. And then here is that last question. What is the most important criteria when purchasing third party tools and controls? Again, select one of the following price, past experience or usage, advice from thought leaders like bloggers, press, reviewers, uh, brand, and again if um, you have an other, you can add that in the questions window so that we can see it. Let's see if we're getting any of those. So yeah, it looks, yeah, some of you are just code rush. Uh, price and advice are those answers. So it looks like about 67% of you are past experience. Great. Thank you so much. These questions really help us shape where we're headed in future releases. Um, and again, you can feel free to email Mark or Rory with more feedback. Um, thanks for all of that. Uh, Mark, Rory, I'm going to hand things over to you. Mark, for the new folks to Code Rush, can you start with a sort of whirlwind view of what Code Rush is and what it can do? Sure, I can do that. Cool. Um, uh, I've, I've got a, uh, a console application here and uh, I've got some Code Rush templates to help me show, show Code Rush quickly. So um, we've got some bullet points here at the top in terms of what Code Rush helps me do. Each one of these bullet points has an orange box around it. That's a field, and so I can just hit enter and move on to the next point. You may see me do that as I'm as I'm working with the templates here. Um, uh, one of the things Coders helps you do is is create new code faster. So, for example, to create a new method, I just type in the letter M for method, and I hit the space bar, space bar, or the tab key, depending on which um, option you have configured for that. And I type in the method name, and then I hit enter. And then I can add any parameters, and when I'm done there, I can hit enter, and now I'm inside of the method. So with very few keystrokes, I can create methods. Um, Coders also helps me declare code that doesn't exist. So for example, here I have some code where I have reference to an enum that doesn't exist yet. I can just put the caret there, hit the code rush key, which is by default control plus the, uh, the back tick. You see it shown right up here in the comment above. And I can just choose what I want to declare. I'll say declare an enum. And there's the declaration. It takes me to the declaration. I can make changes here if I want, add new enum elements. When I'm done, I press escape, and I'm right back where I started. Down here, I have more code that, uh, that, that where I have the creation of a card. I'm returning it from here. I, on the new card, I, I uh, assign a value to its suit and its value property. Um, I assign those things, but the card class does not exist yet. I can declare it just by putting the caret on it, choosing declare class. And there's the declaration. Notice it grabs suit and it grabs the value of type int. It figures out those those types based on what's here, and everything is now compiled, and or, or net, everything now compiles, and, and um, uh, because of the declaration, so we can do this kind of deep declare where we we have code, 
that uh, is, is kind of written in a consume first fashion where I say here's what I want my client code to look like and then once you, you're, you're fine with that you just hit the coder key and start playing the pieces that, that are there. Um, we can refactor uh, with confidence. Coders has an incredibly powerful robust refactoring engine. Um, it's also the most efficient refactoring engine uh, um, from a UI standpoint so, so you as a developer are, are pressing in fewer keystrokes, moving the mouse less um, to do the same kind of refactoring as compared with other tools. So here, for example, I've got this uh, class called car. I can extract the interface, just hit the coders key, choose extract interface. There's my iCar, very quick, very fast. Uh, hit escape to get back. Um, let's uh, make some changes to car. Down here, I've got uh, direction. Let's go ahead and uh, execute a refactoring on that. We'll encapsulate the field, do it read only. So we'll choose that. We can select where we want to put it. With the target picker, just we move up and down. Press enter. There's my read only encapsulation of the field. Um, we can uh, continue now. We've now changed the public interface of car. We can hit the coders key down here and choose add to interface I car. And now if we hit the tab key, we can um, uh, we can go up and we can see there's the declaration of it inside of, of I car. We see that I car is now modified. So I can make changes to car and make changes to interface I car. I should point out that that the interface doesn't have to be in the same file like it is in this demo. It can be in another file. Coders will will make the modifications um, as needed. Um, you can also work with color uh, in, a, in a powerful way. So here, for example, we've got color swatches showing up right in the code underneath the, uh, the from the RGB um, calls. It shows you what that color will be. So instead of running the application or trying to calculate this in your mind, you can just come in here, see the color swatch. If you don't like it, you can click on it and say, let's change that to something a little more exciting. And we can do something like this. Click OK. And the code has changed and the color swatch is updated as well. Okay. Similarly, working with strings, there are a lot of powerful refactorings and code providers in CodeRush for working with strings. For example, here we have a string um, that we can uh, use, uh, apply uh, string.format to. So we just uh, put the caret anywhere within the com composed string, and we hit the CodeRush key, and we choose uh, from the refactor menu, use string.format. And there you can see the preview. This is a distinctive feature of CodeRush. It shows you the changes to the code before it actually makes them. Um, also, all of the refactoring UI is flat. It's right in the code. There's, there's no dialogues that hide the code. So another benefit um, to using CodeRush. Now that I have this here, uh, I can do something, for example, like here, for, um, the parameter uh, of index 2 is that corresponds to date time dot now. I can hit the CodeRush key uh, and choose uh, format item. And now I can come in here and say, let's give this uh, 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 do something like day month, 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 year, year, year. There's a preview of the output right there. And now I've changed that. Likewise, I can come here, miles, you can see it's a double. I can come in here to do the same thing, format item on that, change it to a number. So there, obviously, the preview is going to have two decimal points. And, uh, and I made those changes very quickly um, with that. Um, if I'm working with test cases, if I want to create a new test case, it's easy. I just type in TF for a new test fixture and uh, give it the name. We'll call this a card test to test out that class called card above. We'll create a new test called is red, and uh, I've just got a I've got a, uh, a template here that I added just for the demo that just adds this code. But Coders does come with a lot of templates for working and building test cases, building test cases, and working with test cases. So, for example, if I want to do make a call to assert true, I just type in at, um, and that gives me an assert that is true call. Um, right now, I have a reference to end unit, but um, Coders out of the box supports a lot of um, uh, a lot of um, different unit test frameworks. So if I type in AT in another framework, I'll get the corresponding call to whatever the corresponding assert dot is true call, whatever the equivalent is. So let's type in card dot is red. Is red doesn't exist. Um, I can use hit the coders key, declare it. There's the declaration there. Notice it gets the type right. It sees knows that is true. Takes a bool. So um, uh, it makes defines this as type bool. Let's not implement it yet. We'll just come back and we'll run the test case. I'll come right on here, run the test. Curtis is the fastest test runner. There's the failure right there. It's highlighted. Um, and uh, we can bring up the, the, uh, the, the test runner here. Let's see. Here's, one here. here's the unit test runner. And you can see there's the failure right there. We can navigate to the failure. We can see the error message. We can go to the test. We can see those things, all of those things from the test runner. Um, I'm using a feature called uh, tap and mix reference. 
and I just hit the tab key to go to the next reference in the code. And now I can type in the code here, whatever that's going to be. Again, that was a shortcut template there just for the demo. Come back over here, click on this, choose run the test. This X means it failed, but it also says, we hover over it, that um, uh, it, it says that the method of operation is not implemented. Um, and we can just here and say run test again. And there it comes, and now it's bringing the test as fast. Um, you can also use CodeRush to improve the quality of the code. For example, here in this code, it's found that data set is an undisposed local. It's a local variable that uh, implements idisposable, and it's not disposed within the method. So it's created but not disposed. So we can go ahead and say, let's introduce using statement on that, and we've now fixed that problem. Um, similarly, down here, we can do the same kind of thing. It can find these kinds of problems, and we can fix them very, very quickly. Okay? And down here. Um, another cool feature in CodeRush is the duplicate code detection and consolidation. So here I have two different methods, one called max, one called min. They're structurally similar. The differences are essentially in this line right here. Min, if t is less than min, is equal to t. Otherwise, it's equal to min. And down here, the calculation for max, if t is greater than max, then it's t. Otherwise, it's max. So here we're trying to find the, the biggest. And up above, we're trying to find the smallest. We also have some strings that differ. This says calculating min. This says calculating max. Coders can handle these differences and consolidate. You can say, let's consolidate the current class. We'll do that. Go to preview. Come up here. We'll select the location. Now our two methods have turned to this. So they're only passing in the distinct differences. So here we're passing in an actual function. We're saying t is less than min. Here we're passing in uh, t is greater than max. We're passing in the differences. It looks like that. Okay. Um, we can clean up that consolidation if we want to. It kind of makes sense to do that. Here it says min here. What we really probably want to do is call this edge, for example. So it's going to be the min or the max. And this flunk right here, that's what's passed in. That's the function that returns. The, that answers the question, is t close to the edge or not? And so we might want to um, uh, change this. To, is uh, Actually, that closer is greater than like that edge. It's farther out than edge, something along those lines. or is edgier than. We can do something like that. So we can just very quickly rename and make those changes to the code. Um, and, uh, and let's go back. Actually, I'll show one more thing up there, which is kind of cool, which is um, the other parameters, um, just because, um, it's, again, it demonstrates that all the UI is in the source code. We have parameters, just move the pieces around wherever we want to put them, and, uh, and then we hit enter to commit. So that's it. Um, and then there's there's the uh, there's the details on it. That's that's uh, the introduction to CodeRush. Now let's move on to the new features in 12.2. The most significant new feature we have created. I'm going to go ahead and run this application. Is called um, the Debugger Visualizer. And so well, I've run, I'm running an application. It's a console app, and I've just got some methods here and some breakpoints set up in it. And here at the first method, you can see immediately that something new and different. Is, is going on. At my breakpoint, I actually see in my parameters, I can see the parameters displayed right underneath their declarations coming right in. And so there they are. So I get a, a, a display of them. Now, it might be useful. Let's go ahead and bring up the um, locals window because you might want to be comparing with this. At this point, if you're, a, if you're a fan of the locals window, if you use this a lot, it is not a, um, uh, it's, there's not a lot of, too much difference. I guess the biggest difference is is that if you're curious about first name, you don't have to move your eyes all the way down here and find it. You just move your eyes to there. If you're curious about last name, you just move your eyes to there. So there is a, a significant reduction on gaze shift, right, which you may find valuable. You, you may dismiss and say, well, that's a small move, not a big deal. But let's keep going. We're going to go ahead and hit F10. And now we have not yet executed this line of code yet, right? We have not executed this line of code yet. However, you can see right underneath it we can see what the result of executing that line of code will be. And so one of the cool things about the debug visualizer is it shows you the results of the line of code you're going to execute if it can calculate those results without side effects. Okay? So it shows you those results before the line executes, which can be useful. It might be a, there might be a method call in here, and this might be an unexpected value. And what you really want to do is drill into the method. So you can, you can go ahead and drill into that method, see what that value is going to be, and in some cases, it can save you steps. Otherwise, what happens if you get an unexpected value, right? You step past it, you realize there's a problem, you try to go back to the beginning if you can, you change the, uh, you, uh, uh, you tell Visual Studio this is the new active line, and you try to, try to step forward from that location and then drill in. It's a lot of extra steps. 
by showing you the preview of what the expression is going to be, um, we, we hope to, it's designed to save you those steps. So another thing that you can do, so again, actually the other thing, I, there, there's like, my mind wants to go in like two different directions at once. Let's, let's do this one at a time. One of the really important things that's happening right here, and this is really super important for C Sharp developers, is we are on the return line, and we are actually seeing what the results of the return of this function is going to be. There is no way that I am aware of to do this in Visual Studio if you don't, if you have a, a situation where you are returning an expression that is calculated, right? If I wanted to see this in Visual Studio, I would have to do like edit and continue. I'd have to do something like this. I'd select this, I'd introduce a local, I'd bring it up here, and I would run it, and then I'd come up and hover over the local to see what the value would be, right? I'd have to go through all those steps just to see what the result was if that's what I want. Let's go ahead and we'll inline that so we go back to here. Let's go back in again, and we will. Um, We'll go ahead and bring this down and we'll take a look at it. And so there you can see, here's what we've got. We've got, uh, we can look at the pieces of it as well. So now I've brought up the um, um, Expression Explorer, and I bring that up just by hitting Alt Down, and here you can see that this string right here, this constant, and you can see exactly what it is. Again, you just look right down below. So there's the first name, the last name, the first name. Let's run to the next point. Here we are inside of Get Hypotenuse. You can see I'm passing in a three and a four, and I've got a calculation in here. Hit F10, and now I'm at five. Let me five. just interrupt here for a second, Mark. Go ahead. I was, I was seeing one of the uh, bye bye. Yeah, one of the really key things here is that, like Mark said, you, you'd otherwise have to fiddle around with your code and, and introduce locals and stuff like that, or maybe add watches. Yeah, so you can add those down to a, a tool window, but the tool window takes up a huge amount of space. Alternatively, a quick watch, but that involves a dialog that includes most of the screen when you're doing it. Every single piece you're seeing here is exactly next to the variable or the constant that it represents. You can see it exactly where you need to see it. You don't need to move around. You don't need to figure anything out. You can concentrate on the algorithm you're looking at, and it, you don't even have to think about it. I mean, half the time you'd be like, move a mouse to hover over a variable, and up comes the little piece. But every parameter there has got it there for you, just for you to look at. We're not even having to overlay on top of everything. We're extruding extra space beneath the initial signature and before the first open curly brace in which to put this extra information. So we're not hiding any of your existing code. We're not putting anything up in front of it, over the top of it. We're not making it in any way harder to read. So everything is just that much clearer and you can concentrate on the problem in hand. Uh, well said, Rory. Well said. Yeah, there are, normally in debugging there are a lot of UI blocks that get in your way and Rory highlighted many of them. Um, let's keep going. We'll look at this math.square root call. I'm hitting alt down arrow to drill into it so I can see my result is 5. Inside there I'm passing in 25 to the math.square root, right? You can see it off to the left. So what we do is we take the code pieces, we duplicate them down so you can see them there. So right within context, so you can see this 25, it doesn't just, just float by itself. You can just see what it's connected to. Um, as I move around, the piece I'm connected to is highlighted. If I move down, if I hit the down arrow or the right arrow, you can see, you can see uh, as I, the, the pieces expand. And over here on the side, this is um, the node map. And this node map is essentially a tree view showing you what the expression looks like in a tree form and where you are in that. So here I'm over here on this side, and I can see I have two children that I haven't explored yet. I hit the down arrow. There I've now seen the two children. And so now I can see that 4 times 4 is 16. And over here I can see that 3 times 3 is 9. And 9 plus 16 is 25. And there's my 5 out there, the square root of that. So I can see all of that happening, right? And compare that with the results that are coming in from locals. It's just not there. I don't have that kind of detailed information. That's excellent. Right? That's so if we started back where it said five and twenty-five, if we were happy with that, we could have just gone and see, you know, shift the ten, go straight over that. That would be no problem at all. But if exactly. we're curious as to exactly how that twenty-five has been derived, we can step into any sub part of that expression and see exactly why that is the case. Just so it's there it. if you need it, but you, it's not forced on you at any point. Yes, absolutely correct. Also, if your hands on the mouse and you want to go in, um, like, like um, here, let me come back up here one more time. I'm going to just move uh, execution back up here, hit F10. If your hands on the mouse, you want to go in, you don't want to hit Alt down, you can just click here and that'll enable the mode. But then now you have to at least go to the, the uh, right now you have to go into the arrow keys to move around at that point. So sure. it is, it's really built for keyboard driven, not mouse. But I wanted to point that other option out for opening that. All right, let's keep running and show you another another cool thing. So here, by the way, in this method, we're only showing values for date time and for days rented because those, you can display the others, are not really that interesting. 
this customer is of type uh, drill down test dot customer. It's a class, right? We can see it right over here. So it's not it's it, a value displayed for this is not going to be interesting. So we don't display it. Same thing with location, right? It's not helpful. So we're not displaying that value. Um, okay, so we're going to hit F10, and I'll show you another feature of the debug visualizer, which is very cool. Here off to the left, you see that age is, is zero, because it hasn't been, this line of code is not executed yet. Over here, we have a refresh button. And if I hover over the refresh button, the method that is causing, that, that is associated with side effects, the method or the property is highlighted with the red underline. So here, if I hover over, you can see that the reason that the debug visualizer is not showing you the value is because datetime.now, it has side effects associated with it. In other words, each time I call it, it's going to be different. Okay? So I can call it by hitting, clicking the button, or I can drill into it by pressing Alt down arrow, and now look at what's happening here. I can actually go and explore the pieces and the children, even though, and see what the values are, even though I don't have the value for the piece that causes side effects. So if there's an expression that's complex and part of it has side effects, I'm still allowed to go in and export all the other pieces without introducing the side effect, without making that call. Okay? I can go ahead and make the call now, and it'll tell me whatever the time is now. Of course, when I execute it, this will be, it'll happen again one more time, right? So when you click on that refresh button, it might not be, you know, there may be situations like this one where the value you see now is different from the value you see when you actually hit F10. But let's go ahead and we'll hit F10. And in this case, it's understandable because it's a daytime now, and it has it, it is an expression that, that essentially has side effects or it's calculated value that changes. All right. So, but the cool thing I wanted to show here is that off on the left here, age, we actually see the value for age, right? It's right there in the code, and we can see it. Um, it's there, and we see it's in red, which means it has changed. Okay, the value has changed, and then we can see where it's changed. And we're down here on this line, years old. Let's go ahead and hit F10 for that. Now we can see the same thing. Years old is now 36.36853, et cetera. Right? There's years old. It's a double. Okay? I'm on this next line of code, and now Sugars is telling me, the debug visualizer is telling me that this expression is going to evaluate the false. And here that red X off to the side tells me the same thing. That's what this X means. If it, was going to, if it were to evaluate to true, this would change to a green check. And so I might be curious about that because notice if it's false, I throw an exception. We can't rent the car. Why can't we? So I'll hit Alt down arrow and we'll look through. And one of the things that first catches my eye is this false is in green. Okay, and over here on the node map, that same node is a square. Let's move to that and see why is that highlighted like this. This is a boolean, its, its parent is a boolean expression. It has a value of true or false. So the children of boolean expressions if one or more of those are conclusive determiners of the parent's value, if the, then they are highlighted. So for example, here I have a Boolean expression that consists of three expressions that are anded together. This one, this one, and this one. I have three expressions that are anded. And one of them is false. Well, actually two of them are false, but the first one is false. Since these are, are evaluated left to right, the first one that falls causes the whole parent to be false. This one is the conclusive Boolean. And therefore, so this has to do with uh, short circuiting, isn't it, Mark? Effectively, because we know the second piece is false, there's no point evaluating the final piece, at least as far as Studio is concerned and, and .NET. Well, so you know that the, the middle piece was, or at least from .NET's perspective, is probably where the evaluation stopped. Yes, from Visual Studio's perspective, this one stopped. From our perspective, we're actually going in and checking that. In fact, yeah. let's let's verify that that's the case. I'm going to go into is open, and I'm going to return true instead. Okay, comment that out. All right, so let's jump back, and let's now we need to set the um, uh, we need to tell the debug visualizer that we're we're going to do this. We're we're ready to go. We've made some changes, so I'm going to hit Control F, F Shift F10 to tell Visual Studio. Okay, that's the shortcut, by the way, to um, set the next statement. Control Shift F10. So when we do that, the debug visualizer resets, and now we can go back in and drill down, and now you can see that it's true. So, so yes, Rory, the debug visualizer will evaluate even if there is short-circuiting going on, right? 
it, deva it, 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 it evaluates. However, when this was false before, it was not green. And the reason why it, it wasn't is because the, debug val the, the highlighting engine knows about short circuiting, right? It knows that if I have A and B and C, and if the last two are false, it's just the first one that really determines the parent's value, right? Sure. So very cool. You're in a Boolean expression. You're trying to figure out, wait, why is it this way instead of what I'm expecting? You hit the down arrow, and your eyes move to green. And that tells you why it's false, OK? Mm -hmm. And why is this false? Well, we can drill down even more, right? Over here, there's our node. We've got some children we can drill into. Drill down, and we see, oh, look, accident count. The customers had five accidents, but our min accident threshold is three. Right? If we're going to so, to, go ahead. We've got a quick question relating here. Basically, um, someone's, someone's wanting to know how you're navigating around. And basically, the answer is just the arrow keys, aren't they? We've, we've kicked yeah. into a special mode here. And um, certainly we can bring up our keys window there. But we're just using the arrow keys. It's left, right, up, and down. Effectively, the, the node tree that is up there, you, you can see exactly how things are connected. And you're basically following the path up, down, and around, going exactly where you want to instinctively based on where you can see is available next. Right. So I hit right arrow, left, down, right. You can see the keys I'm pressing here. To start it, let's go back one more time. I hit Control Shift F10 just to reset it. Right? Brings resets the, the debug visualizer. and and uh, now I hit Alt down to start, and that's how I start. Just Alt post the down arrow to start. And this is arrow keys. And at that point, if I want to continue, yeah. I just hit F10 uh, to continue. There's my turn to exception. I'm going to hit Run now, and now I'm at another breakpoint. Do we? Do we? Do you think we clearly answered that question? Is everybody happy with that in terms of moving around? Good, yeah. It's just the arrow keys. I mean, we can okay. look. Any you other see the keys thing there? There's nothing special particular down there. There's just all the standard keys you'd expect to be pressing for navigation, effectively. And I wanted to just show this. I wanted to show again just the refresh here, so you can see that there it is. And we'll we'll drill down into this, and now you can see again how you can like go in here. Here's a plus b is less than min value. Five is less than forty-two. That's all true. That makes sense. And down here, we aren't actually seeing it because the numbers are giant. I wanted to just show you what happens. What happens if the value is much bigger than the space we have? You just see a little uh, dot 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 ellipsis, and so you have to hover over that with the mouse, or you can actually just move if you move and highlight it, you'll see it underneath. There you can see the hint updated. OK? So that's what's going on there. If we want to refresh, we can go in here and we can click it. Again, there, like I say, right, it highlights. It's the call to exist that's, that's blocking. So I'm just going to go ahead and refresh it. And now I can see what the result is all the way through. And now that I have the result, notice now I have a conclusive Boolean expression. This is false, which means it's, it's why its parents is false. OK? These are, this is really helpful. I think you're going to find when you're, when you're when you're debugging, the expression is different from what you expect. You go down, you're going to find the green highlighting is going to be very helpful. You're just going to go right to it, and you're going to say, ah, I see it, I understand. So you can effectively link that first value of false that we saw on the top line to the value of false that's highlighted with the green and say, this is the reason why. This is ultimately why this turned out to be false. Right. And, that's, and this is really valuable, right? It, we realize that you generally are, most of the time, you're not going to drill into a complex expression if the value is what you expect it to be, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, you won't be drilling in. So, so it's not, it's, you know, it's only the times you're drilling in. Is, it, most of the time when you're drilling in, it's because the expression is different from what you expect. So that's why we're highlighting these so that you can see what are the conclusive Boolean pieces for the parent, Boolean expressions for the parent. And again, I just want to show that one more time, the conclusive stuff. Here we have an expression condition one or condition two and not condition three. I wanted to go inside of here, drill down into here. So we see the overall result is true. And the reason why is because I have false or true. This is the conclusive. And I, the reason I wanted to show this is because this, if I drill down into this, it also has two conclusive pieces. So these two green true expressions are conclusive to their parent. I just wanted to explain that, right? The, the, the highlighting of the conclusive piece is, is only to its parent. In other words, these two being true are, I, I don't know if you really argue that these two being true really makes this one true. It's really that one being true that makes it apparent true. So, so the reason I say that is because this could have children as well that could have, you know, something that is not conclusive could have children that are conclusive, if that makes I sense. I guess you could say that the, 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 the sum of all conclusive objects on the given line are equivalent and therefore lead to the, the sum of all conclusive items on the line above and the line above sort of in a chain reaction. You know, not so much the line the line piece, but I would say the um, Should we say uh, sibling the, the um, yeah the, the um, 
the the uh, the parent is what I would say. So, yeah. so all right. So let's go to the next thing I want to talk about, which is let's see where is that? There we go. It's not that one. It's I'm going to go. I'll go in here. I'll bring up the um, two of those. Let's go. Actually, let's let's go back over in our console application again. I'm sorry, the drill down test right there, and let's go in here and uh, let's look at some just some code that's in here, and I'll show you the decompiler next. So we have. I need to get to string dot. I guess we go to directory dot exist. That's kind of interesting. So. If I want to see the decompile for this call right here, I can hit, let me bring up the um, keys window so you can see it through that. So if I want to do this, I'm going to hit Control-Alt-N to bring up our menu, and I'm going to choose Jump to Declaration. So if the declaration is in my source code, I'll actually go there, and if it's not, it'll bring up the decompiler. Let's bring that up so you can see it. And there's the call right there. So you can see there's the call. And if I want to explore further, I can just click on here, external exist helper. And so this is new in 12.2. And I can explore around. I can go back. Um, I can hit the backspace as well. So I can hit backspace to go back. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of nice. It's very much together in a, a very familiar metaphor for, for navigating around. Mm -hmm. It is. I can search as well to, to find things if I want to do that. So um, uh, there. Uh, so so if you like that, let us know. And if you have suggestions for that, let us know as well. But but the way I've been using it mostly, Rory, is from you know from this situ from this point right here, right? Like example there. I'm I'm here. I want to see what it is. I hit Control Alt N, jump to declaration, and then uh, and then it shows me what that um, what that is right there. Let's zoom up there. Let's close this down so we can get a little more space. You see it. So that we can see the declaration of high. Okay. All right. Let's move up. Let's talk about the coders advisor next. And um, let's type in some code. So I'm just going to come down in here and uh, let's type in, for example, um, public and dictionary and int, comma, object, close friend. And uh, this will be method. We'll just call it. Uh, Get super results, open friend, close friend, and like that. That's and quite a familiar piece of code. Many people will type to many different times because dictionaries are pretty, pretty generic, as you know, generics would suggest. And uh, yeah, we've all done so, this sort of code. So now it gives us this kind of. At first, if you're if you're not familiar with Coverage templates, this looks a little bit strange. But if you click it, it says next time save keystrokes with md dot i comma o. And it seems a little bit obscure, but let's try it. MD dot I comma O. Oops, O. And we hit the space bar, and then we can type in get super result, or whatever it is. Super duper result. Seven keystrokes, including the space, and then the name. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and then hit enter, and then we're inside to do friends, and hit enter again, we can go down. So, so if I'm inside here, and I like type in string, my stir, like that, for example, um, uh, I was expecting this to show up. Sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, uh, sometimes it, well, it doesn't get everything. I should say that it doesn't get all of the things you type. If you, um, uh, because it's dynamically parsing and, and doing this while you're typing, if you make mistakes while you're typing, um, it's possible that it may not be able to actually get the the um, the thing that you're interested in that you're looking for. Um, so uh, that is a possibility. Like in this example here, I just typed in my string my stir. Let's see what else we can do. Let's type in like public, um, int, uh, age, uh, get, set, close paren, and come down. And there we go. It says use the AI template. Okay. And so let's try that AI template next time. AI space. And now we just type in age and hit enter. And so there you can see that working there. So as you type and write code, the advisor is, is watching and may give you suggestions for templates to help. Now I should deravel this, the, you know, for anybody who's new out there, you know, so I, I should unravel this. What is it? How did this give me that? Well, M means method, D means dictionary, the dot is just a separator, I means int, comma is for the parameter, and O means object. 
So it was a method that returns a dictionary that is keyed by an integer uh, of objects. So when I read that, I, I read method returning dictionary of integer and uh, object. Perfect. And it, when, as soon as you sort of put those, those the, the of keyword, or maybe it's a keyword here, it's the angle brackets, um, yeah. and on the end, you sort of you start saying these things, they all become very visceral for you. Yeah, I would agree with that. Let's try one more, one more see if this works. List of int, my super list equals new, uh, hit enter here, open paren, enter semicolon, get to the next line, and now it suggests next time use nl.i. New list of ints is what that means, and there you can see what the expansion will be. So we'll come down in here, we'll type in nl.i, hit the space bar, and then all you have to do next time is type in my super list. So, the advisor. It watches what you do and has suggestions for saving keystrokes in the future. Um, you might give it a try if you're new to the templates and if you haven't, you, you, you haven't done anything with them yet. I'm going to just delete these pieces right there for yeah, a sec. That, those pieces of advice, they also they queue up in that window there. Okay, And I believe we even have an option that's, uh, even if you don't have the history advisor physically on screen, we can pop up a, a kind of a banner just beneath the, the, the drop downs at the top of the editor there, which will let you know, oh, by the way, you just did something which you know we, we have advice for. New advice has been added. Whenever you're ready, feel free to go and have a look. So you can keep yeah. going with whatever you're doing. Ignore that for the moment. Or if you happen to be in a place where you're happy, click the button and away you'll go. You'll see the, the history. The, sorry, the uh, the advisor history. And there you go. There's the information relating to exactly how you can make yourself faster what you've just been doing. There you go. All right. And so those are your options for you. you just right click and choose hot. Let's choose the options. Um, next, I wanted to show um, some of the changes we made to the Coders training window. Um, and there are both, and, and I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to say both good and bad things here, right? Um, there are good things and bad things that happen that happen to this 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 window. Um, the, with, so the good things are is that this window is now um, uh, able to show templates that are custom templates. So this was a request we had from folks who were who were sending coders making additional templates. They wanted training for their te custom templates they added to show up in the list. The yep. downside is, is now you see a lot more than you used to see. It used to be reduction, there used to be a reduction of noise, and now you see a whole bunch of stuff. Now, with regard to the downside, it's something we're going to work on for a future release. We are, I, I, I want to make this so it's as noise free as the original, and so that we're showing you really important applicable information for what you're doing and not showing you a whole bunch of noise that just doesn't matter. Yeah. However, with that said, let's look at some of the things that are here. For example, just here on the second one right here, we have a dot followed by a, an ellipsis. That means if I start a template with a dot, I can get access to one key templates and also comments. So let's do that. We'll type in a dot. So the ellipsis is like when you see it on a menu. Okay, It means there's more after this. Exactly. Okay, this is just the beginning. And so this, it's a little bit hard to see. There's my When you start seeing the other ones, this will make sense. But the the, on the left side there, right above the caret, is, the cursor is uh, the dot I typed in, and here's the next one. It says, so put in two dots to get, um, and then the space bar to get uh, uh, a C-sharp mobile on comment. So there's a nice uh, nice little shortcut, two dots, and the space bar gives me that. Okay, So that's one example. If we scroll down a little bit further, um, we can see that I've got a capital M for declarations, a lowercase m. We'll go ahead and try the lowercase m. We'll go down there. You kind of, you've seen that a little bit already. It works on methods. And there you can see in your expansion there is a method. Let's name. see how that one changes if you if you go for the same template that you were before, which was the, the dictionary of. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. So type in you'll DNX. see that how the, the the training window will now adjust with each new key hit to show you the available options going forward and showing you a preview in each case where possible of what's going to happen should you stop at this particular moment and hit space. Yeah. Um, and here, so for example, we see MD by itself is going to give me a method that returns a double. You can see the preview at the top. However, if I keep going, I'll get these things, right? There's more. There are more things here available. One of them is is the dictionary. If I put the dot in, so let's do that. We'll type in the dot, and then we we'll go to the next piece. Well, we want this to be indexed by int, and you can see how these are fanning out, right? You see plus 26 more. This is really challenging to do and do with the, with the templates because the templates give you combinations for hundreds of thousands of declarations, right? And it's not that you are, nobody is ever, you know, imagining that any customer is going to memorize those. What you memorize is a small set of rules, 
right? That D is for dictionary or double or you know what you know those kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? If I want a double, I use D. If I want a dictionary, I use D with a dot, you know that sort of thing. If I want a string, I use S. If I want an int, I use I, right? So customers memorize the, those, those a small set of rules that make sense and then combine the rules together to get access to all of these things. So here, for example, templates here, and I can type a comma now and keep going. And then I can get uh, uh, is an Ophir object. There it is right there. There's my Ophir object. And so I can just so use this. This is help build for building uh, a template phrase, you might say. Um, the same one that we used before, but now you build it step by step with help on each and every piece. Uh, so you know exactly where you're going, what, what, what piece what piece each piece represents within the final output. So you're learning more and more about how the system functions, how those pieces work, how they connect to each other. So over here on the right side over here, I just want to show this, you also see below the templates, and if, there, if you see a bunch of templates filling up the screen and you're on a small resolution monitor like I am, you can just scroll down and you can, you can see what's, what, what will be in the refactor menu if you hit the refactor key, what will be in the code menu, what will be in the jump to menu? So you can see those things, what will be what you'll have access to at any point in the code as you move around. And then we also are showing some shortcuts as well. We're highlighting shortcuts, including custom ones that you define. So those are the changes to the training window. It is at first, like I say, noisy. I apologize for that, but it is totally representative of what you have inside of the um, inside the product. Absolutely. If you've decided to change any single keystroke, and believe me, everything here is configurable, um, then your changes, your your particular key combination will be what shows up here. So if you happen to forget what you changed it to, we'll help you with the current configuration, not the necessarily out of the box all the time. Always what you've got available to you right now. All right. And with that, um, we are done, Amanda. Do we have any other? Do we have any questions we need to ask? I'm seeing some questions that look like they're not answered yet. Uh, Keith is saying this is awesome. To develop visualizer does it just show the data for the current scope. So I guess the answer to that is kind of yes. It shows the local values is what it shows. You're not going to see, for example, the values of fields that are not referenced inside of the method. right? So it's just essentially it shows you what you need as you're going through the method. But if you have a field that's referenced inside the method, it will show you that value. So I, I think the answer is it shows you everything that's referenced in the expression. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any way? Oh, it looks like I've already answered that one. Is there any way to expand the visualizer result? You just come up with an example. Yeah, I showed that. You just hover the mouse over it. And anything else? Can templates be created that will generate objects based on database tables? Um, yes. Templates are totally extensible, uh, and it is uh, it's not hard to do something like that. You might have to. Uh, create a plugin that that uh, that um, uh, that that implements that adds some code, but it's not hard to do those kinds of things. You can do that. And will I be doing a webinar in Visual using Visual, Visual Basic? Bradley asks, and I always punt and pass the ball over to uh, my friend uh, Rory. To do the it's been done. Stuff. You have done it before. I mean, that's one of the key key things about templates um, is, is that they will emit the language that you happen to be in the project for, and that typically will be the exactly the same execution strokes to do so. Um, we do in C Sharp simply because the majority of people seem to be interested in that language, but certainly we could do in either language. It wouldn't be a, a huge problem either way. Yeah, but the answer is, yeah, I can do it. I probably have enough time to do it on here before we before Amanda finally closes us off. Shuts us down. So, um, yeah, are there any questions? For, are there questions, Rory? I'm just going to keep my focus on this. And um, I've been keeping track of the ones which uh, have not received answers, and I believe we're pretty much down to not a lot. So, if, if you do okay. have any questions, we and we have a few moments here, but by all means, please do ask away. Uh, if we can't get to them here, well, certainly you can email me, uh, Rory B at devexpress.com. Uh, I'm sure Mark will be happy to take questions as well. Also, if you happen to be on Twitter, Rory Becker is my username, and I, I just live for helping people with this product. This is one of the most fun to use programming tools you can have because you can be so productive with it and there are always new ways we're finding to, to do things really really well so punt the questions at us any which way you can find us and we will be happy to answer and I just wanted to I'm doing a demo in BB now I'm pressing the same keystrokes I was I was pressing in the other in the on the in the C sharp program and, and generating functionally equivalent code so that, that that's another cool thing if you're working in two languages you can you just still think down to a simple set of keystrokes Okay, so there's your Visual Basic webinar.
Um, anything else? Looks like we may have everything taken care of. Amanda, you still with us? I'm still here. There you go. I knew you were there. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I think this is related. I just want to say I think there's like a little time warp that occurred because of the uh, impending end of the world that I think is happening tomorrow. Did you notice that? It's like it looks like we went over time, but we really didn't go over time. It's just like a, a time acceleration, yeah. a weird thing that happened. No, you're perfectly in time. Uh, let's see about. if there's any more questions. Oh, no. Someone's saying, oh, Paul. Paul Escher's saying the Mayans were wrong since he is actually already, it's already Friday where Paul Escher is. I think Paul so Escher is talking to him. Doesn't it happen at like 8 p.m. on Friday, Paul? I think you still might want to, you know, run for cover. <laughs> all I'm saying. I think uh, the tablet as a per, as permanent once you have set all the variables. I think it that, is. Yeah, I think it's permanent as soon as it comes out. I mean, here's the thing. So, so let's look at this. Let's do. Uh, let's create a new method. So I'll just say M space. So here. The method is, this is, I think you're talking about these, the variables. So these uh, are yes. called fields in orange. So we just type in the name, so we'll call this like get, you know, or, or, or maybe uh, set, set, um, set state. Hit enter, and now I'm going to do the parameter. So I might type in vs for a variable type string and say like name. Hit enter, hit enter, and it's, it's essentially permanent. Yeah. It's permanent at each step, right? It's just so I'm guessing that basically the answer there is it's the enter keystroke that accepts what you've entered at each particular piece. Okay, right. and although whilst most of the demonstrations we've done here involve a single piece of data entry and moving on and then again moving on again, um, a single piece of data entry could affect multiple areas of the template. So if we were to write a, a property, for example, uh, with getters and setters and internal variables and things, the initial typing you do first of all expands the template and also links multiple pieces together so that the internal variable, the, the private variable would have a, a related name to that of the property whose name you were giving. So you have all kinds of connective tissue, but when you hit enter on any given piece, that's it set. Not so much in stone, but for the duration of the template, you're good. Um, you want to go back and edit it, you probably want to cut it out and regenerate. Okay. Um, uh, Alphonse has a question. Where can we find examples of templates to generate objects from database tables? I am not aware of any at all. Roy, are you aware of anything that does this yet? Nothing specific, no. I mean, I can see generally where he's going. He's sort of looking from the code generation perspective. Maybe so there's some other tools that do sort of, um, I guess, you larger scope um, generation. Code Rush can be made to do anything like that. Basically, all of our features are plugins to our basic core. So if you want to contact me, Rory B at devexpress.com, we can certainly explore what it is you're looking to achieve and how you might want to get there. Um, we're happy to help you on pretty much any topic relating to code So I'm just typing in contact Rory B at uh, devexpress.com. I'm putting that in there. And I also I want to say that... Uh, um, ah, I, I that's a good question. I, I was Sorry. just going to... Rory, I was just going to also say, I think this is like a very cool kind of thing for... Um, for us to do and blog about. So I kind of want to say, sure. uh, can you do that? Would you uh, yeah. be willing to, to do that, create a blog showing how to do this? And so we'll get a good response. Uh, plus, still, I would like you to, if you could, send an email to Rory so he can, you know, he can send you an email once that blog is up and published. Uh, and uh, and we'll, we'll get you information on how to do that. That will be a cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, Keith, Keith is asking, what's the next big feature coming to Code Rush? Keith, I, we know what it is, but it's everybody's sworn to secrecy. We're not telling until, you know, probably as soon as six months from now. Um, do you plan to update sheets, the shortcuts and template sheets? That's, yes. That's I, the good question. Um, because I got, we have a feature now, don't we, to cover that? Oh, that's true. We do have a feature, don't we? What is it? It's, I, think it's, um, I think it's control alt question mark or, or forward slash, depending yeah, on your keyboard. You're right on that. So control alt and, question mark. And it looks like it's cropped off on uh, on my my screen because of the uh, resolution sure. I'm running at. Uh, well, effectively, that's a live cheat sheet again, based on your exact configuration that you have. So if that's out of the box configuration, then that's what you'll get. If you've altered any of those, again, that's what you'll have. You'll, you'll have the, the actual live variation. So it was uh, Control plus Alt plus the question mark or the slash forward slash P on my yeah. So forward slash P is what it is. So um, that will give you the live cheat sheet. However, we also have, um, uh, uh, I, I was just reviewing today, a new cheat sheet that, that I'm expecting, if all goes well, will come out um, in, uh, 
uh, the coming days. It just was missing shortcuts for uh, doing the test runner, and I wanted those added. So, um, so I'm expecting those out in you know next week if there is a next week. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what else? I should was I think by just saying my own simple CR templates for SQL and DB scripts like create table, drop table, save it. So Stephen's saying that. Stephen is yeah. So so I, I have talked to people who have done that as well and created their own templates for for just setting things up. But I think that the I think Alphonse more probably wants to have some more intelligent generation is my guess. Probably wants to generate objects, for example, based on tables. That's my suspicion. And so yes, it's possible to do that. Okay. I it feels like we're kind of we're at the end of we've answered all the questions. And uh, Amanda, do you want to take us out? Do yep. you have anything else you want to say? No, I'm good, man. That was pretty good. I'm good too. Kids, try that debug visualizer. It's amazing next generation stuff. Oh, it really yes. is. It's going to save you time. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Mark and Rory. Uh, you can visit devexpress.com slash webinars for upcoming webinar sessions in the new year and register there as well. And while you're on our website, you can also download our universal 12.2 trial at devexpress.com slash trial. Uh, you all, one more question just popped in from Lionel. Would the debug visualizer, visualizer work with JavaScript? We are working on that right now. Um, there are some challenges in getting it to work with the JavaScript. We're actually working with Microsoft on this. We're trying to get some, you know, get the get the right workarounds and, and doing the get, doing the research needed to make it work. But it is a priority to us to make this work. We have a number of developers working on it now. Um, uh, and I should also say that, that you know, with regard to the debug visualizer, we are we realize this is a significant major um, feature. We've had a lot of feedback on it. We've had a lot of a lot of people saying it's awesome, and we've had some people saying, "Hey, you could make it even better if you took it here to this level." And we and that's one of the things we're doing right now. And so we expect you to see in future minor updates, right? Three updates coming in the mix in the coming weeks. We expect you to see improvements, continued improvements in the feature, as well as support for JavaScript. We we expect that we are going to be able to solve the technical challenges. Um, it, Soon, and so that that's what we're we, we've got manpower on it. it. It's not like we're just leaving this here and it's going to be like this. We are um, we want to make this thing you know perfect in everyone's eyes. And that's Absolutely. What we're doing. Yeah. Um, Robert's asking are there SQL templates? There's nothing that we ship out of the box for SQL, but there's nothing that stops you from from there's nothing that's going to stop you from making your own if you want to do that. You can do that. In fact, all the templates, everything you've seen is just stuff that we ship with the product. You can change everything that you've seen. Um, however, it's you know I strongly recommend you keep it because it's it's a lot of thought, years and years of thought have been going into these to make these as efficient as possible. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rory. Okay. And of course, thank you all for joining us. Let's see what develops. Bye, bye, everybody.